Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Streaming Alchemy. I'm John Mahoney, and on today's show, we're going to do a bit of a dive into SRT, the Protocol Re uh, Secure Reliable Transport, and look at how you can use PTC Optics cameras with vMix uh, at a remote location, <laughs> uh, you know, having vMix separated uh, from the cameras and be able to switch a show. So that's what we want to cover today. And uh, as always, if you have any comments, have any questions, uh, please just post them uh, as we go along. We try to get to everything you ask here during the show or during the post show. And uh, if you'd actually like to join us live on air, please just, uh, we have a link for you to go to that's in the show notes and you should be able to uh, have somebody from the studio get you on with us. So to get started, let me talk a little bit about how I'm envisioning this setup to look. And I have a diagram for all this here that I think will be a pretty good overview. So what I'm looking at is having a way to have cameras and a controller at a remote location, basically some type of event venue that you'd want to uh, do a, a show from, but have the switching take place at a remote studio. And the thinking we have in setting this up is that you will need somebody to go to the remote location and set up the cameras, plug in the audio, do all the wiring. So having that uh, PTZ controller at that location probably makes sense. But all of the sort of heavy lifting, the things you may want to do around you know, CG, other types of integrated elements, anything you want to do with the actual switch, with streaming to, you know, different uh, downstream uh, CDNs, all of that can be done remotely from your studio. So that's the, the general model. So let's talk a bit about how we have this configured. So for this example, because I wanted to show something really concrete as we did this, uh, we're going to be using two PTZ Optics cameras. Uh, and PTZ Optics cameras have the ability to do SRT streaming directly from the camera, which makes them an ideal candidate for this type of scenario where we don't want to have a computer that we have to set up and deal with at the event venue and really just keep all the compute power back at the remote studio. So the way you have the setups, we have two PTZ Optics cameras here. We are using a wireless mic setup here where the receiver for these two wireless mics will plug into the back. The, there's a line in on each of these cameras. So we would plug that into the back of the camera and that would allow us when we take and transmit the video to have concurrent with that the uh, in-sync audio uh, that would be coming in. So that is sort of the main component of the video gear and the audio gear. But then sort of technically, uh, all of these will be connected via Ethernet cables to a switch. And we had envisioned that this would be a switch that you would be able to bring to that remote venue. Uh, and in addition to having these two cameras connected to the switch, which would be PoE in all likelihood to simplify the wiring, you can also have a PTZ controller connected here. And if this is something like the SuperJoy, you can actually just have a small, one of those small, uh, like Feel World monitors, uh, something of that sort that you could just sit in front. So when I pick a camera in the controller, you'll actually see a stream of video from that camera appear on the monitor, which would let the person who is at that event venue basically frame up every shot that they want and make sure they look correct and relatively in focus. So that will give you sort of the entire framework here. And that's basically all of these elements connected by HDMI for this link here uh, between the SuperJoy and the monitor. Uh, the orange cables are Ethernet cables. So those would just be, you know, Cat6 cables probably. And the little blue cables would just be uh, line level, you know, actually for the case of the uh, cameras, 
that would be like a 3.5 millimeter jack cameras just plugging into the back there. All of this then would be plugged into the venue's internet. So that's sort of a blind element to you, which is why we didn't sort of describe any infrastructure outside of this switch. Uh, that would plug into the internet and then on the studio side, which is remote from the venue, you would have a router. And in that router, we'll go into some more detail, but in that router, you would have to forward uh, some ports to allow that uh, video traffic and audio traffic coming over SRT to uh, make it back into the studio. And then from there, it's just a network cable connecting you to your vMix system, and you can take that in as an input. So I'm going to go a little more into SRT next, but we do have some comments here. So I'd like to sort of pause this for a second and go and just... Uh, touch base with everybody who's been commenting so far. So let's see, I think we have Michael. Yeah, Michael, thank you very much for joining us. As always, it's great to have you here. So Obsessive Audio from Toronto, Canada. Obsessive, thank you for joining. Great to see you again. So uh, Live Mix Mastery is saying, is it just me or is the audio out of sync? Uh, I don't know, but... Uh, since you point that out, I'm sure the guys at the studio will uh, take a look and uh, see if there's anything that we can do if we are. So apologies if you're having difficulty with this. Uh, JP, hello. Thank you for joining us again. Good to see you. And let's see, ABC surname is saying hello from uh, India. So ABC, thank you. Great to have you here. And you the man, uh, say, say, looking for another great show. So hopefully, uh, hopefully this fits the bill for you. you. Thank you for joining us. I definitely appreciate it. Okay, so what I'd like to, to do now is let me, since we sort of laid out the general framework that I'm looking at in terms of the sort of architecture and topology of an, a, a remote event venue, an event venue that's remote from the studio. Let me talk a little bit about SRT and dig into how all of this plays together. Because I think this is probably the most important technical piece in terms of understanding what we're going to be doing when we set this up in, later in the show. So here is generally the pipeline. So we have in SRT the ability to take a feed in this case, a feed directly from the camera going over to a vMix system, which is, you know, in the remote studio. The hops that this has to go through, let's just start with that. So this camera is connected to a switch. So that switch, in this case, we say PoE, so it's a single cable. So that cable will carry video. It will carry audio. So if we have something plugged into the back of the camera, It'll carry that audio signal. It'll carry all the control signaling. And it will carry, so the control signal is both in SRT, for everything for the control of the protocol, but also for something like the, uh, the SuperJoy, where you'd be doing PTZ presets or you know, dialing things specifically in at, on site. So all of that is coming over a single cable into the switch. This switch, when it goes to the internet, has to be connected to something called a router. And the router, in essence, takes what is considered private IP. So on a local network, all those IP addresses that each individual device has are called private IPs. And they are essentially non-routable. I can't take a private IP and connect to it from a private IP in a totally different uh, IP space. So you know, that, that is basically the lack of routability, but it adds a layer of security because it means that somebody has to almost be on your local uh, switch somehow or within that local IP domain in order to uh, connect to devices there. So, but that is a private IP and you can, people can have the same private IPs in different locations, it doesn't matter. That's just local and never goes outside of that network. 
But when you connect to a router, what that router does is it says, I am providing a single private IP that everybody connects to, usually the dot one. So in this case, it would be 10.0.0.1, if this were a you know 10.0.0.x network. And it converts that to a public IP. And now a public IP is one that anybody can see that's on the internet. It is unique to you. So that IP uniquely identifies this uh, device on this location. That's how all traffic that's going to be sent into this uh, event venue or out of this event venue, they're all traversing through that IP address. And the way that when you transmit something over that public IP, there's a second piece to an IP address called a port. And a port is basically like there's 64,000 ports. So on a single IP, you can sort of go colon and maybe 32,000. I may, I may be doubling it, adding an extra bit in there. But you have a very large number of ports that are available to you. And so if you want to talk to something uniquely, you can actually specify a specific port on there. And by adding that port, you now have the ability to sort of use that single IP address, but have this router look at that IP address and route it to different devices on the network. So you can know port one goes to my camera one, port two goes to camera two, wherever you want to set it up. So you can have that framework worked out. So the way SRT works is when this remote location, sort of the event venue, not the studio, so when the event venue wants to connect to the vMix system, basically my remote studio, it is using the public IP of my remote studio to talk to me. So how does this work? The camera calls. So they're in SRT, there's a caller and a listener. The caller initiates the session and the listener sits there waiting for a caller to call it. So that's how that sort of pairing works. So what this camera will be set up for is it will have the IP address of my studio plus a specific port number, I tell it. Uh, and from there, when the router in the studio sees that public IP and uh, the, the port number, it will convert that into a private IP uh, and port that's on this internal network. And that's how I make this connection. Now, what this does require is that there is a forward in the route. So inside of your studio-based router, you'll need to say any traffic which comes in on this port to my router, map it to this private IP address and port on my internal network. But what this means now is that I can have the camera connect to my studio without having to do any network work on the event venue side. So I just take whatever they have. And that's one of the big advantages of SRT is that it allows me to make that type of traversal. But to do that, the remote site, sort of the, the event venue, has to be the caller. And as I said, in SRT, there's a caller and a listener. So since the caller initiates, the caller is the one that's going to the public IP address and port. And that's why nothing needs to be done inside of the event venue. And that really makes a big difference because you have control of this router, you don't have control of this router, and you've got to get somebody else to try and do something for you. This takes all of that away. So how that is sort of how the connection works. But how does the sort of secure, reliable side of this transport work? Inside of SRT, you actually set up a specific latency that you want. So latency is basically a time delay. It says, when I send something out, I want you to buffer it up for this amount of time before you start to decode it on the remote end. Uh, and this way, since you have this caller sending to the studio, you can now in that window of time, that latency, 
you can do anything you need to correct the stream. So when I am sending something out, so when this camera is sending out an SRT feed, what it's doing is it's populating a local buffer. Basically, this isn't necessarily buffering it in the traditional sense. It's almost like a storage buffer. So every packet it sends out, it keeps a copy of it in this local buffer. And once that gets sent out, the receiving side, the listener, actually starts putting these packets together and it doesn't send them out until after that time window. So if we said 500 milliseconds, which is a very common one, it's basically gonna take every packet that comes in over that 500 millisecond period and keep it here in the buffer and then start sending it out. So it basically is creating that latency, but it uses that latency. So if anything drops in the interim, it can go back to the sending buffer and say, please retransmit that packet. I didn't get it over here. But it doesn't do it so directly. What it's really doing is on the receiving, on the sending side, it's waiting for a certain period of time. And if it didn't get acknowledgement that the buff, that, that actual packet was received, it will actually go in, and retransmit it. So it is very efficient. It doesn't require a lot of round tripping. It's basically pushing out packets. And once it gets an acknowledgement that a packet has been received, it removes it from this buffer because it doesn't need it. it. Knows it's over on the other side. I don't need to keep it. So buffering in SRT works slightly differently than you would get in other systems when you think of buffering. But by doing this, it allows this side to make sure every packet gets received and the packets are all in the right order before being sent on to be decoded inside of vMix. And the other thing to keep in mind is that when you think of this latency that you have inside of the SRT protocol, it can compensate for variations in throughput and for different type amount of lost packets, but it can't compensate for there just not being enough bandwidth. So the way to look at this is when this camera encodes the video to send it over, it encodes it at a certain bit rate, the average throughput over this latency period has to be greater than the bandwidth, the throughput, the encoding bit rate that this camera is sending the stream out at. It doesn't have to at any given moment. You could turn around and say over this 100 millisecond period, it was much slower or nothing got through. It was totally blocked. But if we said over that 500 millisecond period, I need to, to be at a point where all of the packets that needed to get sent have been received over here. And so that's the other thing to keep in mind. It compensates for unreliable variability where at different time intervals, the, the bandwidth may not be sufficient, but it doesn't compensate for in aggregate bandwidth, which is too poor or bandwidth, which over that time window does not measure up to the input throughput that uh, is expected to be transmitted. So. That's really the SRT model, sort of from the connectivity point of view and from the buffering and transport consideration. So we have a few more uh, uh, comments in here. So let me just see. Uh, I want to be sure we... So, okay, somebody's saying that Facebook is out of sync. So WP Business, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. So uh, WP is also asking, uh, with multiple cameras and maybe audio feeds, the question is, how do you keep everything in sync? Facebook is not syncing you in your audio now. So there's, there's a few things. One of the things, and it, it requires basically all the different components in the pipeline need to respect this, but you can set inside PTZ Optics cameras uh, and I'm sure other cameras are similarly situated, you can use an internet time uh, stamp that will basically, the, these, these, these time clocks that are on the internet can stamp each packet that is being sent, and that can keep those packets synchronized and uh, allow you to make sure they're all correctly ordered. So that just gives you a, a basic, simple way to do this. But that needs to be respected on the listener side, the receiving side. And you know, different products have different capabilities with regard to that. 
So there are different types of encoders that do that very well on both ends. Others, it's more freeform. And uh, Facebook is coming in over RTMP, RTMPS actually. Uh, so I'm not sure that RTMP has that time stamping ability. Uh, I'm sure it has some rough sync capability, but not that same level. But that's how it's handled on SRT, which is why SRT can be used for actual multicam shoots because certain decoders are able to take and make that synchronization between multiple feeds, audio and multiple video, uh, and make sure they are all basically time synced. So let's see. Uh, so hello, thank you for... Uh, Vijayuro, I'm sorry if I haven't said your name correctly, but thank you for joining us. Great to have you here. So let's see. So Michael is asking, so the caller needs to know the public IP at the listener site and the port, which the listener is listening. So that is, that is correct. So when you would send that camera out, you would program it with the IP address of your studio and the port that you know in your router you're going to forward into uh, the internal private part of the network to, for vMix to access. So that's exactly how that would work. Okay. So Michael's saying, isn't there also a bi-directional setting uh, besides call a listener? So yes, that's called rendezvous. And I can say that rendezvous can work. Uh, and what it basically does is both sides need to know the public IP addresses and, the, and agree to a port that they want to communicate on. And then when they come on, when they get ready, uh, they will both try to connect. And so in this, the goal is that if I send something out on one port, uh, the router on the other side will sort of help me discover the listener or the receiver. So it sort of just merges those two together and blends them. The problem is there are a lot of firewalls and a lot of routers that don't conform to everything that's needed for rendezvous. And if I were looking at this as sort of a, a professional gig, something I was doing to, to get paid for, I would definitely want to make sure that that connection could happen. And the, the best way to do that, since you control the router in your studio, is to make your remote or your event location the caller and your studio remote from that the listener because that way you just program your studio IP and the port number and you'll know that that will come to your studio uh, without any sort of network configuration outside of what you have direct control of. So Sergio, uh, thank you for joining us from Argentina. Uh, he wants to know if it's possible to send more than one SRT signal, uh, receive and synchronize SRT uh, signals in a remote place to send from there to YouTube. So, yes, but uh, in order to do the, the synchronization, uh, you would need to have the device, the receiving device, or in this case, the listener, as we've been talking about here. The listening device, when it has these different SRT streams, it would need to know that these all need to be synchronized across each other. So not only do you sort of like have synchronization of different feeds within the one transport stream, but you'd also need to know that the, uh, the different streams that are coming in also need to be synchronized. And as long as they're all coming with the same sort of network time protocol timestamp from the internet, then you know that when you receive them, you can line them up. But that requires some intelligence on the receiving end, and not all devices have that ability. But that's how you would do that. And that would mean like if you were doing sports where you had, you know, you were moving between like a soccer player that was getting ready to kick and another camera angle, you wouldn't have that. That would be seamless. You would have that same motion in their leg going to the ball picked up on a different camera because you had that sort of synchronization, that clocking. So that's, uh, that's, that's really a... Uh, a higher end feature. And I know, you know, some of the, uh, you know, Makito encoder decoders have that capability and sort of move that in and out, you know, from sort of an SDI into SRT on the encoder and a, a decoder 
uh, into a multiple SDIs out on the decode side, and it keeps those all in sync. But those are, you know, you're talking sort of six thousand dollar US hardware uh, to do those types of things. So those are those are much higher end, but that is definitely a possible technology to use. So. Bill Ashton, thank you for joining us, Bill. Always good to see you. So thank you. Ryocaster, hi, how are you? Good to see you. So uh, yeah, so uh, as Ryo was mentioning, SRT really is an incredibly useful tool. And we talk about it as if it is just for the internet, but it can also work like inside of a venue if you're going from one location and venue to another and the network connectivity could be dicey. It could also be used internally. So just keep that in mind. It is just a transport protocol, uh, and it can be bundled in different ways. But uh, yeah, it is incredibly useful in a lot of situations. So Ryan was saying that last week he teamed up with a partner studio, and you know, the broadcast was kind of a hybrid model. And from their studio, they were using everything locally. But uh, you know, the game cameras and everything was sent by SRT. That is exactly one of the key use cases, where you can have satellite studios and bring those feeds in. Uh, this would be something that is probably used in something called insert studios, where you'd have sort of a camera that would be set up at a remote location with sort of a lighting and everything else, that if you wanted to do an interview with sort of a, you know, a head of state or any one of the sort of key, uh, you know, politicians or people of business import or whatever, they'd come into that studio and you'd have sort of a, a mini crew that would feed that back to the main studio. So definitely, uh, you know, ways to, to handle all this. So uh, Ryo was saying that uh, SRT has a six minutes delay. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, I, I'm not sure. The, in most cases, you'd have up to eight seconds sort of your, as your normal dial-in uh, for SRT, but I'm, I'm sure there are ways to do much longer delays in that. That's really just a question of managing the buffering. So... Uh, yeah, uh, you know, that's, uh, that, that's one of the big advantages. You can control that, uh, that, that buffer size. And the buffer size in this case is a time-based buffer size, not a bit or byte-based buffer size, but definitely useful for a lot of these cases. Uh, so he's asking, do I know a zero tier one? It's a VPN app that is perfect for SRT. So yes, I, I've heard stuff about it. I haven't used it, uh, but definitely, uh, my understanding is what that will let you do effectively is not have to do port forwarding. Uh, and I, I could be wrong, but when you connect to this, those connections then can happen basically seamlessly. But like I said, I haven't used it. So I don't have a real reference to, to comment directly. But yeah, that, that's, that's part of it. It basically acts like a relay server. Uh, so uh, JP is saying that his challenge is simply vMix to vMix, and it seems to be a port problem. Yeah, I mean, you can set up uh, one vMix to work with SRT as an output and then have that come in as uh, an SRT input on another system. So that's definitely, you know, probably gives you the most control over what you, what you send uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. So definitely something uh, that uh, if you want, just come and talk to, to us about it. We can maybe give you a hand with figuring out what you need to set up. So, uh, yeah, Obsessive Voice saying, we're talking about Larix Broadcast. There's a free app that can turn your smartphone into a SRT camera. Absolutely. If I if I were looking at something where I didn't need to send a signal back to the remote, uh, uh, and I was just taking that feed, that would be Larix Broadcaster is a, is a great free app, and I would definitely recommend it. That works wireless, cellular, so definitely very cool. So, yeah. So, yeah. So uh, Raya is saying that 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 adds six minutes, and that's very possible. Like I said, I know there's lots of different uh, sort of hops that can be, take place in between and each of them can sort of introduce their own latency and buffering. So things like the secure part of SRT, uh, that can add, you know, you know, half a frame kind of delay uh, to a uh, input. So if you're taking an SRT feed and you have basically two cameras and you have one with encryption, one without, 
there's added latency there. So latency is cumulative, and I'm sure there are lots of devices that give you more expansive buffering control in SRT. So thank you, Ryo. Okay, so what I'd like to do next, uh, since we talked about using the listener piece in the studio, I'd like to jump in and show how we set that up here inside of uh, vMix. So if I come over here, let me sort of basically move into the framework we have here. So those are just two slides. And I actually have two cameras coming in. One of them is on port 8000, the other is on port 8001. But I'm just going to show exactly how we set these cameras up. So if you want to add a remote SRT source, what you do is you say add input. And when you add the input, you'll see you have stream SRT. So that's what you're going to go to. So there are lots of different stream types that vMix can take in. But in this case, what you want to do is just say, I want to set up an SRT listener. So the way we have this set up right here, it, it's actually very simple. For this example, we're not using any uh, security, so there's no sort of passcode. As I mentioned, we're using a uh, two ports, so we're using 8000 and 8001. So in this case, this would be 8001. Uh, I set a latency for 200 milliseconds. And since we don't have anything else set up here, uh, it's pretty straightforward. I can just go here and then I can say, add this as an input. And I'm gonna use the hardware to decode. So when I click OK, this will connect. So as opposed to doing that, I just said, this is exactly what you have set up here. So if I go here and say, change it, uh, this pauses the camera and you go here, you can see this is exactly what I have set up. The other piece that I have in here is something I didn't use, but you can set up a stream ID for these cameras. What a stream ID will let you do is you can just have one port forward and specify stream IDs on both sides and it will allow you to carry multiple <clears throat> SRT streams across a single public port and feed that in. So it's just a, a, a way to even simplify even more the networking involved in getting SRT set up. But that's all we have here. And when you say, okay, it goes, makes the SRT connection, the camera keeps calling. And on the listener side, this comes in and you can see it's, it's basically set up here as a pretty straightforward thing. And that's all we had to do. We set up what what I, what port do I want to map across SRT and what buffer size, what latency do I want for my configurable buffer? And I edit. Very, very simple on the listener side. The only thing you need to do is route forward, port forward on your router to make sure that that signal gets here. But that's all that needs to get done. The other thing you'll notice, now I, I don't have any real audio coming through here, but uh, this can actually take the audio signal as well. So whatever you have plugged into the line in on your camera will be coming through here as well. And you can route inside of vMix. So the other thing to take a look at is, and it's probably something that isn't really used that often, but you can get viewing performance statistics. And what this will give you uh, is this will give you the statistics for different things that you have inside of your system. And one of them is specifically for SRT. And so what you see here is you see the how long this connection has been, the percent of packet loss, total data throughput, uh, and the number of retries. Uh, so it's sort of giving you that sense. It's also showing you the bandwidth. And this is something that we set up inside of uh, the cameras. So the way to think about bandwidth in this case is that you have a some sort of encoding codec that you're using. So in our case, we're using, I think, H.264 and H.265. Those are the two that we're using. And you can set a bit rate inside your encoder to say, this is what I want you to encode to, this bit rate. 
And that's what gets reflected here. That's all set up in the camera. And we'll go into that specifically, but this gives you a sense of throughput. But if you want to think of like working in an, a, a remote venue, this would be like, oh, we're not going to get 85 megabits per second up link speed. And that's correct. I mean, we, I did this just because the reality is I'm just doing this as a local connection, but I'm showing you all the steps as if it were a remote connection. I set this at this, but if you think of what you can encode something to, to view. So when you're doing a stream, I think the stream we're doing here is at probably seven or eight megabits per second. Uh, and at, you know, you can actually go lower than that and still have a, a fairly good quality signal. So take these numbers as sort of just indicative of the scope of how you could do things between, you know, to uh, an SRT caller and listener. But you can get this down to very small numbers and still have a high enough quality signal that you could easily use it in, a, in most productions. So just be aware of that. That information here is uh, down here in this little uh, sort of stacked uh, bar chart that's giving you statistics. So that should be helpful. So let's actually look at how this gets set up on the camera side. So when you go into the camera UI, you normally you'll, you'll, you'll be given a login, you know, which sort of the default admin admin for PTZ optics cameras. Uh, and the way you get to this page is you just type in the IP address of the camera. Uh, you can also type in a name of the camera. If you've given the camera a name, you can do, you know, your camera name dot local. So that's another way, which is get you into uh, this uh, page here. And these have all the different settings uh, for your camera. So the SRT specific piece is down here in streaming settings. So when you click on that, it sort of pulls in everything from the camera. And you can see here, there's the RTMP, RTMPS settings that are up here. And then there's the SRT settings, which are right here. Uh, so the first thing you have to do is you have to enable SRT on the camera. And this camera is a Move 4K. I have a Move 4K uh, and a Link 4K that I'm using for this demonstration. Uh, so you have to turn SRT on for the camera. You set it into caller mode. As we mentioned, there's caller and listener that, that are sort of set up available on the camera. Uh, you have to put in the what's called the SRT server. This is the public IP address of your remote studio. So if these cameras are in one location, that's going to be the public IP address of your remote studio. And this is going to be the public port that you want to have uh, that you're going to call into on that remote studio. As I mentioned, we aren't using encryption. It just adds latency. But I can go in and they have all different security levels. So uh, each one of these adds more processing overhead, adds more latency, but they are all available and you would just use a different key uh, that you put in as your password based on, that uh, based on that security level that you ask the encryption level. These two, uh, SRT bandwidth overhead and SRT variable latency. So the SRT uh, bandwidth overhead, inside of SRT, whatever bit rate you're sending this out, what this tells you is what percent of that bit rate do I want to allocate in my stream for all the signaling, for retransmission of packets. So if you have a more questionable network, uh, you would range, you would sort of bump that up. Uh, but this means that if I have, you know, a 200 millisecond, uh, you know, latency that I put in here, and that's what this variable latency is, that means that I'm expecting that with just having 25% overhead on my bandwidth based on what I encode to, uh, that means that I could, could actually make sure everything within that 200 milliseconds will have the packets returned that it needs. And uh, so anything that's dropped is corrected and out the other end. So these are the two you're really playing with to manage the uh, 
the quality. So you're, you're sort of coming from, you know, do I have sufficient buffering and do I have sufficient retry bandwidth allocated for any packets that get lost or dropped? But what you don't see here is you don't see the aggregate bandwidth, like how much bandwidth is this signal taking up? So when we looked on the statistics page in vMix, you saw that I had 150 uh, 50, uh, megabits per second and the other 32 megabits per second. So where is that piece all set up? That is actually coming in in the audio video settings. So if I click over here, what you'll see is you have your standard video encoding settings for how you, you want to do what's coming out your uh, SDI port or your HDMI port, sort of your physical connection. But then you have two, in, the, in P2Z optics cameras, you have two encodes. One is sort of your high quality encode, and the other is your secondary sort of low quality encode. The high quality encode, your IP video stream one, is what is being used by SRT to do your transmission. So you can see here that we are using H.264. We're transmitting this thing at 1920 by 1080. And we have allocated 32, uh, uh, you know, 32,000, so basically 32 megabits per second. Uh, you know, 32,000 kilobits per second uh, is what we have allocated here. So that is giving you basically all the encoder parameters that are going to be feeding into SRT. So if you were working in something where you said, I have to keep each of my camera feeds to 5,000 uh, megabits per second, I have, you know, 20 megabits up, uh, that's where you'd set it. So you would come in here and you say, no, this has to be 5,000. You may turn around and say, I may be doing something local where I'm recording at 1080, but maybe for this remote transmission, I'm going to down it to 1280 by 720 because I, I want the best signal possible in the bandwidth I have available. These are all the options that you have now when you're doing this. So these are the tools you're using for setting up the encoding. And as I mentioned, SRT is agnostic to the data being pumped through it. It doesn't care it's video, it doesn't care it's audio. It basically says, I have packets of data and I'm moving them securely and reliably from location A to location B across an inherently unreliable network between them. And that's really everything that's going on here. So if I wanted to, and I had, you know, in this case, I could go to H.265 encoding, if that's something I could decode on the other side, or even MJPEG. Uh, and these are all options that, you know, H.265 is more taxing uh, on the encode and decode side, but better compression. So again, you may turn around and say, I want, 10, I want to do 1080, but I'm going to do H.265 because I'll get, I'll use less bandwidth for the same quality but I need more compute resources and to be able to decode H.265 on the receiving end. So this is where all of that is set up. But once that is all in place, uh, what you'll typically do is you'll get your streaming settings for SRT, you'll get your uh, IP video stream settings up here for all your encoding, you'll reboot the camera, and then it'll go back when it finishes rebooting call back to the studio, and your studio, if it's listening, will pick that up and send that feed through. But that gives you a tremendous amount of control now over how you deal with this. And I think the key thing that we were talking about, so if I, if I sort of switch back to uh, the diagram we had in the beginning with the event venue and the remote studio, what this gets us back to is how this whole process now really works. We know exactly the bandwidth that's coming out of these cameras because you can set that in the encoding. Uh, you know the latency that you have in the SRT piece because you set those up in the streaming settings for SRT. And then from the ports, you, that's how you know the traversal can happen. And on the vMix side, where you're doing the listening, all you need to do is say, whatever port I've taken, the private port here that I map from my public port that my cameras talk to, that's what I'm listening on. And when that comes in, I have a video feed coming in at the bit rate set by the encoders up here. So that is really 
the, the full overview of how all of this works. So I know there was a lot of sort of technical parts to this uh, across different devices, but hopefully in aggregate, it makes sense because this is really, as it, it pertains to vMix, this is a fairly straightforward exercise for adding SRT into vMix, even if there's more things involved with getting the sort of remote framework set up uh, you know, to, to receive these SRT feeds. All right, so let's see, do we have any other uh, settings here? So any, any, any other setting, any other comments? I'm sorry, it's been a long week here. So uh, Larix Broadcaster of Vmix, so this is Michael uh, asking, which would give you the best signal? So I think the, they're really different use cases. So Larix Broadcaster uh, is probably going to give you the best signal in terms of what you can control. It won't necessarily be a better signal, but it gives you the most control to coax the best signal out of whatever's coming from that remote uh, location over the, the bandwidth you have available. Uh, VMix Call or things like, like Live Tear, all of those are just going to be browser to browser typically. So you don't need to install software on the remote end. And the quality, uh, it sort of adjusts the encoding quality based on the line variability to preserve a, a very small latency. So if you think of them, Larix Broadcaster or any, any SRT based protocol has a fixed latency that is typically a bit higher. You know, so you're sort of 200 to 500 milliseconds. Uh, compared to something that's WebRTC, which is probably closer to like 50, you know, certainly under 100 milliseconds. So the WebRTC protocol is more conversational. If you want to be back and forth with somebody and sort of have that sort of, I want to interrupt and, and sort of have those types of discussions, vMix call, live to air, any WebRTC is probably a better choice. If you need a stronger quality, a higher quality signal, from a remote location, uh, very much the way you'd see, you know, people in a newscast throw it to a remote reporter, where you turn around and say, "Okay, you know, uh, what are you seeing there?" And you'll see, even in those things, there is latency. That's usually satellite-induced latency, which is even higher than SRT. But you see, there's that sort of pause, and then they talk, and that's a continuous stream. It's that same sort of thing, since it's higher latency. Uh, it's more. Uh, it's a more favorable technology for that type of, I throw it to somebody, they have a, you know, a longer continuous stream of talking, and then they sort of hand it back and then you pick up from there. So different use cases, but that's the way I would sort of couch those two technologies. So yeah, uh, I think, you know, there is, vMix call uh, does have, you know, the fact it's it's sort of baked in is is it's it's really strong selling point. But yeah, I mean, I think there's there's lots of different things you can do with WebRTC to uh, create higher quality uh, settings uh, and you know just a higher quality signal. And you know, it, to be honest, that's the 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 real advantage of WebRTC in any of these cases is the fact that it's ubiquitous. Every browser today has sort of WebRTC baked into it, mobile devices, you know, Mac, PC, it doesn't matter. So that adds a, you know, sort of a generic nature. So you'd want in anything that's added to a WebRTC product it either need to be an optional component because it wouldn't be universally supported or it would be something that uh, you would be able, the, the receiver would be able to understand what's capable and sort of adjust accordingly. But, you know, as we talked about SOT versus uh, WebRTC, WebRTC uh, tries to keep very, very low latency and adjust the bandwidth. SRT takes the other approach. It takes and sort of has a fixed bandwidth and a fixed latency, uh, and that gives you that higher quality. Uh, but you're, you know, you're basically dialing in latency to make sure you can get the quality signal you want over the bandwidth you have. So, but uh, so that's why, you know, sort of framing all these, they, they are complementary protocols. 
So, uh, Michael's saying you need one port per camera or a distinct, a distinct stream key. So, I, I didn't set it up this way. Uh, you know, we just didn't have time to, to do all the testing for that. I set it up as one port per camera. And that was sort of the traditional SRT model. In, I think, 1.5 uh, of the SRT protocol, they added the ability to have a stream key. Uh, and what I... What the stream key lets you do is you can assign that stream key to each uh, device and both to the caller and the listener. And what will happen is all of these devices will now connect to that same public IP and same port. But when that's routed to the receiver or the listener, what the listener will, will do is it will say, well, what's the stream key associated with this stream of data? And it will know to route that to one input and it will use the stream key of the other. So even though I set it up in this case for two distinct ports, uh, under vMix, is this is something that you can do where you would just have uh, a single port and multiple stream keys for each of the different devices coming in. So... Uh, I see that YouTube has been rolling out the ability to live stream using SRT. Yeah, not seen in Canada yet. I, I haven't seen it here yet. That is that is definitely something uh, I would like to to try here. It isn't available to me yet, but uh, I know there are some other folks that have it. Uh, so, yeah, I think there is a lot of uh, options now for SRT streaming. And, and in reality, SRT is really going to become, at some point, the RTMP, RTMPS replacement. It just, there are too many advantages really in the SRT universe to sort of give up, uh, you know, to, to, to stick with a, a, basically probably a decade old uh, technology, if not more, uh, with RTMP and RTMPS. So, yep, uh, looking forward to seeing that obsessive. So thanks for pointing that out. All right then. Uh, so, I think we're probably uh, at a good wrap point for the show. Uh, hopefully, everybody found this useful. <laughs> uh, I know, like I said, it's, it was a, a bit on the, the geeky side, but it's also fairly straightforward. So we sort of called this a, a vMix Basic, mainly because the configuration uh, of this, even if you don't necessarily understand all the, the details on the infrastructure, I think it's fairly straightforward and could be very useful. So I wanted to make sure that we put it out there and tried to make it accessible. But... We're going to call this a wrap for today. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for joining us. If you'd like to hang out for our post-show hangout, uh, definitely would appreciate that. Uh, you know, there we hopefully can talk about any questions you have from today's show, any other streaming-related questions, any other general tech questions that you want to talk about. We're pretty open. So uh, hopefully, if you can hang around, you have a great week. If not, I'll see you in a few. Take care. Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, glad that everybody that, that that hung around for this. This this was a. Uh, so a slightly different show. I know this was this sort of harked back to some of the stuff we were doing in our first season, where I was really focusing a lot on how do you how do you describe sort of technology that is used in the streaming space, cameras, audio, things like that. So it was actually fun, sort of doing something which was more about how the tech works in a production space, and uh, hopefully you found it interesting too. But SRT really is key to so many different things that are, are taking place today, sort of so many different trends. And one of the things you'll, you'll notice is that even though I set this up more as a, I'm going from, you know, your studio location at, in, you know, sort of a physical location out to an event venue, what I'm really thinking in, you know, doing it this way is I could have been running vMix in AWS and none of this would change. I would have an IP address and a port uh, inside AWS that I would need to to uh, 
to take and route to vMix, but everything else would be the same. Uh, the other thing that, oh, uh, you demand uh, has basically come back, said he was part of a testing group. Uh, I was, oh, it was part of a testing group, but uh, he was too late to apply, and so he's in Canada also. So, yeah, uh, uh, with that, that's, uh, yeah, that's something that I think, you know, YouTube tends to, to do these types of, of rollouts where they have different invitations and, and try to get different parts of their community involved in sort of new tech. And I think that's great. I mean, of the platforms that we, we sort of work with, I, I think YouTube is definitely really forward looking on, on how they put all of this together. And, uh, you know, I, I know that, you know, all these platforms are competing for, you know, capturing a video audience. But for us, uh, we think that Facebook has been great for having the group and the ability to talk that way. And YouTube has been great in terms of the, the tech for streaming, for embedding, for notifications, all of that, we think has been really great on the YouTube side. So they each have their place. But yeah, I think they're, they're going to be competing uh, around technology. Absolutely. That's coming as part of everything that uh, these folks are doing, because I know that's a, that's a cutthroat market uh, in terms of drawing eyeballs. That's their advertising model. So, so thank you, you. So the other piece which I didn't talk about, and this, this, is, this is important as well, uh, is that say you wanted to be able to control the presets using uh, your remote studio uh, as opposed to having somebody there control. Maybe you want somebody there to just like set up the cameras and the audio, then sit there and wait till you have to tear it all down, which could be fine. You know, the different people feel comfortable doing different parts of a, a crew job. So you may not have somebody there that would be comfortable doing the camera work. Uh, but you could certainly do something like, uh, you know, Chrome remote desktop or team viewer or something like that, and just put a, a system at that uh, event venue that you could use then to control uh, the, uh, the cameras. And if you look, I'm, I'm just gonna switch back. Maybe if we can call up my screen over here that I have uh, with the PTZ Optics interface here. Uh, you do have in this a, you know, like I said, this is just an IP address. So if I could uh, uh, connect out to that remote computer, I could call this up as a browser and I could then go and do, you know, any things where I have the ability to do sort of the, the zooming and the panning and do all of that stuff. And I could do all that, you know, remotely as, as needed. And because this has presets, I could just sort of go and say, I can just, you know, pop to different presets that, that I have set up. And, you know, this will, you know, it, it sort of freezes that while I do that. So this is just different things moving around. And we have the camera set so it doesn't stream back the whole motion. It just goes to the second preset and resumes the feed. So it gives you, you know, a, a, a fairly simple way to do this, even if you need it to do that remote, uh, do, do that control remotely. Or, again, because you are connecting in vMix, you have PTZ control in vMix. So that would be something else you could do. You could set that vMix uh, PTZ controls up, and that would be something that you need to do with port forwarding at the remote end. But that could be very useful. Say you were doing something like a, a ministry where you had church service, and that was a fixed venue, and you had that sort of control where you could do all the port forwarding at the venue side, but you needed somebody to switch and stream from their home uh, or another remote location from that. Again, you could do that, you know, all within vMix or even with the SuperJoy at, at the remote end as opposed to at the event end. So different ways to do that, but I want to share that. So Michael has a question. He's saying, could you have two SRT addresses at the caller streaming simultaneously? If I then had two vMix listeners on their own public IP, I would have that kind of failover possibility. Uh, so the quick answer is yes. In the way the cameras are set up, that isn't a possibility. So uh, your camera can go to only one IP address when you set it up. Uh, but if you did something, because uh, we didn't really talk much about 
the settings inside of vMix. So actually, this, uh, let me sort of jump over there and show if we go to the vMix settings here and we go to outputs, uh, you, you should have the ability uh, when, you, when you set these up to, to set these up with SRT uh, associated with these outputs as well. And so when you have that set up here, you now can go and you could have a single camera output go across multiple uh, SRT outputs. So if I come in here, I could just enable SRT and uh, have it a caller, type the IP address of host one and uh, the port and the same for the second output, which could be different. And that way you could have from that remote location, one camera coming out to two different ports. And so, I mean, you could do that for two cameras here. You know, that would give you, you know, because you have four outputs on the vMix 4K, and each of those could be a separate SRT output. So that just gives you another way to do that. But inside the camera itself, it can only be set up uh, for, for a single. So, and Michael, yes, these are the Elgato lights. So I actually, I have this set up, and the thing I like about it is, uh, let me see if I can actually sort of hold this up so you can see it. But... Uh, so we are using, uh, sort of get it to focus, uh, always difficult. So we're using the Stream Deck, uh, I forget the, the, the name of it, with the, it has the four knobs, and that gives me the ability to do things like uh, I can just sort of, uh, you know, adjust the lights uh, if I want to. And uh, as an older person with the <laughs> sometimes hearing problems, I have the ability also, I have a... Uh, a volume control knob so I can adjust the audio coming back to me. So if I'm listening to a remote caller or somebody from the studio uh, telling me something that I forgot to say or should have said, uh, then, uh, you know, this is, uh, I have the control there. So I, I actually I actually like this as a setup. The Elgato lights themselves, uh, they're really nice. Uh, you know, they, they work, they're probably on the pricier side. Uh, you know, and there are cheaper lights, but just as an ecosystem, I really like the way they all play together. So, all right then. So, if uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, let's let's get them in before we we wrap up. But I, uh, you know, I think that you know, though we we did this with PTZ optics cameras, uh, and sort of that we. You know, I've, I've never made a secret that, you know, we have a really good relationship with the folks at PTZ Optics. And, you know, I think that, you know, for the money, uh, the, some of the gear they put out is, is you just can't be beat. And the fact you can get something like this, where it just does that SRT directly out of the camera, means you can do these types of things where I can do this remotely without having a computer in place uh, to, uh, you know, to, to, to capture the stream. And I think that that is very, very powerful when you sort of think of this as a setup. And for the way we had this setup with sort of two cameras, small wireless mic, a small switch, the, the uh, SuperJoy controller and a small monitor, that's something you could put in a small rolling, uh, you know, port brace case or, you know, any, anything like that, that you could just bring into any, any venue without a whole lot of hassle and get that set up. The biggest part would be stands for the cameras, realistically. Uh, you know, and there are, there are a lot of good stands for that. But that means that with a very small amount of kit at your remote location, you'd be able to, uh, you'd be able to do a remote shoot, and even a cloud-based shoot, which I think is really, really important for a lot of the stuff that's being done today. So we have Aziz. Aziz, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, no worries. Uh, these are things that you 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 may already know, but uh, you know hopefully uh, you get a chance to watch the the replay. And uh, you know if you have any questions or anything, always feel free to send them to the comments. I I know I don't get to the comments as quickly as uh, I'd like, but I do try to get to everybody's comments. Uh, you know and and get back to everybody. So obsessive, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm I'm glad you you found the show useful and. Uh, Thank you for everybody, because uh, you know this is uh, this is a lot of fun doing this. So Michael is just saying I only use the Elgato Light uh, app to adjust the color. Uh, 
uh, power and you know the, the grouping. So yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff that you can do you know with the Elgato lights. Uh, you know, I definitely think that they are, you know, in terms of control and all the things they get you. I think that's probably the best sort of midpoint in the market where you can come and say, I do have a lot of control. Uh, they're not outrageously priced, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, you're not going in sort of the, you know, the Amaran Apture side, which is sort of the Amaran's the next step up and Apture's the, sort of the, the step above that, you know, where they do have even more control, uh, but that's reflected in the prices as well. So, yeah, I think that they fit a good, they have a good slice of the market that they serve really well. So uh, Aziz is asking, oh, I, uh, Tony, uh, thank you. He's, uh, Tony's asking about uh, zero tier. He says he, he recommends that. Uh, and he has a, 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 mir a Microtech s switch uh, with the PC, PTZ. So yeah, I mean, that's uh, the zero tier stuff. My understanding, like I said, I haven't used it. My understanding, it basically acts like a turn server. And so it does the marriage between the remote uh, uh, studio and the event space to to make that happen without any sort of additional network uh, steps needed. And I, that's 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 really, really great for people that just don't want to have to deal with any networking at all. So... Yeah, uh, so that's uh, you know if if it if the uh, Microtech uh, routers have that that built in, that's even that's even better. And you know, I think the the Microtech are probably technically sort of a step up from a lot of the routers that are out there in terms of you know the the configurability, but they also are equally more powerful. Uh, I know there's a lot of stuff that can be done with them. Uh, so that's that that is. That is great to know, Tony. So thank you for sharing that. All right. So uh, I think then, uh, so I think JP probably said thanks and everything. So JP, thank you. I appreciate you joining. I'm not sure if all of those comments are coming through. Yep. Okay, great. So uh, I think at this point, we will wrap it up for the week. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for hanging out for the post show. And... Uh, We'll see you next Friday with another show. Take care, everyone. Be well, be safe.